Hi, I'm Rick Courier, SVP of US Sales and Partner Marketing here at Foundry, where we help connect tech buyers with tech marketers on full funnel programs on sites like CIO.com. I'm also the host of the On The Road podcast, a show dedicated to tech marketers looking to grow both professionally and personally through partnerships. And that's what we're here to talk about today. I'm happy to share the results with you of our latest State of the Partner Marketing study. This is a study to help you navigate growth and challenges in 2024 and beyond. Now, this is a study that we conduct about every two years where we survey tech marketers globally to understand what's working and not working in partner marketing. So before we dive into the results, I just wanna share the top three takeaways from this survey. The first is organizations are increasingly seeing the value in partner marketing. We've made some progress over the last two years. I still think we have some ways to go, but there are some differences in the value perception of small companies versus enterprise companies. We're gonna dive into that a little bit more. But overall, budgets are remaining healthy, and it looks like they're gonna to continue to remain healthy. Next, most partner marketers tend to have a partner marketing strategy in place, which is really good, but we are seeing some differences between those with an informal strategy and a formal strategy and the effectiveness that that has on programs. So we're gonna dive into actual program effectiveness and ROI from those programs. And last, program success metrics have changed over the past two years. Something that was in last place is now first place in terms of the way we're measuring programs in markets. So we're gonna dive into that. So just like I like to do on the podcast, we're gonna learn a lot, but more importantly, we're gonna have a little fun. So stick around. So first, let's dive into value and strategy. Specifically, we're gonna start with a question that we've been asking every survey that we put out there, and that is, what value does your organization place on partner marketing? And the good news is, overall, 68% of organizations out there do find value in partner marketing and they're investing in it. Now this is actually up 6% since two years ago, so we are trending in the right direction, but at 68%, we still have some room for improvement. Now I'll tell you this, a lot of folks that I have on this show where there's companies investing even hundreds of millions in partner marketing, so obviously they, they see the value in it, even these folks still have to constantly justify the value that they're programs are taking to market. I think there's systems that are that are better now. Um, but I think it just, you know, you have to you have to set expectations internally with w what is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, I kind of look at what, you know, the the structure of a, a partner marketing plan of what to expect is really kind of three pillars. So pillar number one is demand gen. So that's pipeline. So that's sort of, that can be measured because that's traditional marketing. We invest some dollars with partners, we do an activity, we get 100 people there, we build pipeline, that's gonna flow through the system. So that demand gen piece. And then pillar number two is really around the brand and the awareness. Mm -hmm. How can we leverage partners to be able to amplify uh, the success and take our message further? And so I think that that's a huge opportunity to be able to look at large companies like in AWS and if you partner with AWS you want to ride their coattails you want to be able to draft off of them yeah um, and then the pillar number three is that enablement which is teaching someone how to fish versus giving them a fish so I know we talk a lot about that but it's just like I, if I'm fishing I'm gonna cast one line I'm gonna sit all day and I may ca catch X number of fish yeah or what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the time to, to help ten people put lines in there and then we're gonna add up everything. Now, up front it takes a little bit more time, but eventually, you know, the long-term impact is, um, it, it will sort of yield its, the results. It's, it's an ever-evolving thing that we need to be doing in terms of advocating for our partners and the value that we are bringing through our programs. Now, we start to see some differences when we dive into company size, and we're gonna see this throughout the study. So, for sake of simplicity, we're gonna define small business as company size below 1,000 employees, and then anything over 1,000 employees as enterprise, and that's where we start to see some differences. Enterprise size companies are more likely to see the value in partner marketing at 78%, compared to 57% on small businesses, right? So, Obviously, you got to think about your partners when it comes to the value perception. So you could be working at a large enterprise and they have your back in terms of what it is that you're doing. 
but you might be partnering with a small business where there might be some question marks in terms of the value of going to market through a partner ecosystem, right? So just thinking about the value that is perceived from your partner's point of view is really important. And we're gonna see this play out throughout the study as well. Next, we wanna look at the most important partners from the organization standpoint. Number one, independent software vendors comes to the top, ISVs. Next, cloud service providers, or CSPs, followed by consultants or system integrators, then channel resellers, and last but not least, OEM or hardware providers. Now again, this is all relative, right? If you're a channel marketer, chances are you think the channel is the most important partner out there, and rightfully so. But again, this is from the organizational standpoint. And again, we start to see some differences based on company size. So if you're an enterprise size company, chances are on average, you see the ISVs or independent software vendors as your most important partner. On the small business side, cloud service providers or CSPs pop to the top. Think of uh, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, or a, um, AWS as an example, right? Now, what I think about is if I'm a smaller company, some of the hurdles I face in the sales process kind of lend to this answer, right? So, you know, maybe I don't have this, the same brand recognition as a large size company. Um, I get questions around scalability, um, flexibility within large infrastructures when it comes to implementing this technology. So as a small company, if I partner with a hyperscaler, uh, a cloud service provider, I can start to meet some of these challenges in the sales process, obviously lending to their brand equity or brand recognition, their scalability, their ability to uh, help me um, customize my infrastructure in terms of flexibility of implementation. Partnering with a large CSP can help with that. So again, different companies are placing different partners from a different value perspective. Next, we look at strategy. So the good news is 89% of the people out there that we surveyed do have a partner marketing strategy in place. Now, when we dive into this number, we start to see some differences. 20% have an informal strategy versus 69% have a formal strategy, right? So there is a little difference in terms of the type of time and resources that we're putting into developing that strategy. This is gonna play out throughout the survey as we start to dive into the effectiveness and ROI of the program. So we're gonna come back to this, but again, remember, a lot of folks have strategy out there, only 69% have a formal documented strategy. We'll see how that plays out. Next, we're gonna talk about budgets, right? It's a little bit weird economy out there. Seems things seem to be going well. At the same time, a lot of data says things are not going so well. And the economy is always gonna be up or down. So let's just see how the budgets are playing out. Right now, we are seeing when we look rear view facing the last 12 months, overall 37% of budgets went towards partner activities. It's a pretty sizable portion of the overall marketing budget. Personally, I've seen organizations lean into their partner ecosystems as a way to grow commercially. I've seen organizations actually use their partner ecosystem to take some of these new technologies to market like Gen AI. So it's no surprising when we look forward facing, 62% uh, actually expect budgets to increase in the future. 31% remain the same. Only a very small percentage actually are not sure or seeing a decrease at 1%. So overall, budgets remain healthy, and, I, and I, I believe that they'll continue to as well. One thing that we're starting to see in the market is not necessarily taking a partner uh, approach to uh, go to market or a field approach, but more of a customer-centric approach. And companies are letting their customers decide how they want to go to market. And that's really dictating where the budgets are going in terms of supporting those activities. And I see that continuing with more of the partner teams that we're working with out there. And we set out to change the world by changing the way we worked with customers, to put them in control of their own destiny. And, and that was ultimately, for me, the vision that we set out for. And, and it translated into the way we acquired customers and the type of customers that we, re we acquired, very open source centric customers. It also brought us what became a channel. We didn't know it at the time. What it was, was all these boutique system integrator firms around the world that were helping companies implement CRM software, suddenly found this kick-ass free open source software up on SourceForge and said, oh, I want to know more about that. Yeah. And then they reached out to us and said, hey, I'd like to become a partner. And our answer was, partner? <laughs> what, what's that mean exactly? What do we, oh, well, we got to build a channel program. So we frantically built a channel program. And 
and that became our primary go-to-market after that. Hmm. We, we became a very channel-centric company, working through partners around the world. Now, the question is, where are the investments going? Well, top three partner programs that are being invested in, um, really uh, several are coming up around the 40th percentile, between 40% and 48%. It's kind of what you expect, social, demand gen, content, lead nurturing, branding, and thought leadership, right? And oftentimes what we're seeing is it's an integration at these top three, right? Rarely do people come to us at Foundry and say, hey, I just want leads or I just want to run display ads. It's more of, hey, here are my goals and what are, what are some things that we can integrate to get there? And it might be a, a lead generation program with a target account list where we also want to surround those buying teams with display ads and we want to develop a white paper, right? We see events here at 24%. That's very similar to what we see here at Foundry, right? About one in four programs we run is an event-based program. It's a crucial part to the buying process. We have another study called Customer Engagement, and we saw that 90% of decision makers had attended an event in the last 12 months, right? They, they want to meet with you. They want to see the technology. They want to see demos. Um, and oftentimes, they're integrated in these top three programs, right? So one of three programs or four programs we run is a demand gen program that also includes a virtual roundtable or a face-to-face -face event, say, in Chicago. Now, again, going back to company size, we start to see some differences when we look at enterprise versus SMB. So if you're an enterprise company, you're more likely to lean heavier into the demand generation. If you're an SMB, you know, you think about, again, some of the challenges that a smaller company has. Um, they're more likely to look at branding, uh, lead nurturing, or content development, right? They might not have thousands of assets at their disposal that, say, an enterprise-sized company has. Now, this might be obvious to you if you're an enterprise-sized company or you're an SMB, right? You know your challenges and you know the programs you're investing in. But again, I think we need to think about this through the lens of what's important to our partner. And this goes back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of the value that is being perceived by the organization. So if you're an enterprise company and your company values partner marketing, and you're more likely to have to lean into demand gen, that's what your organization wants. But you're partnering with, a, say, a smaller company, you might want to lean into these other programs that are more likely to be perceived as valuable with that smaller company. So let's say you want to run a demand gen program, but you're working with a smaller company, maybe you include a custom white paper, maybe you include some social ads to help with the brand brand equity side of the, of the program. Start to lean in and find that intersection between what they might find valuable and also the needs of your organization as well. Now, budgets are only as good as partners that will engage with you on them, right? So it's hard to go to market with a, with a partner if they won't engage you to begin with. So we're gonna dive into the partner engagement side of the results and we really break this down into a couple categories. First, we look at how are we measuring partner engagement then we're going to look at uh, what are some of the barriers to measurement, and then where are budgets going in terms of driving partner engagement. So here are the top five ways that we're measuring partner engagement. The first is just revenue growth rate. How much are we selling through this partnership? Right? Next is deal registration. Are we actually just registering deals to begin with? Then we look at training and cert certification programs. Right? Are we doing any type of education, and how are we measuring those completion rates? Uh, lead conversion rates, right? If we're generating leads, how are those converting? And last but not least, partner satisfaction surveys, right? So let's actually just survey the partners and see how happy they are. In my experience, a lot of companies are doing one, maybe two of these things. Um, and I think the reality is we should be doing more. And the reason is 89% of survey respondents say there's barriers to measuring partner engagement. And those top three barriers are just challenges over the data, right? How qualified is the data coming in? Or do we even have the, the pipes set up to integrate the data? Right, That's a big challenge. Next is just limited visibility into partner activities. And then last but not least, you know, the reality is there's a lot of privacy or, or regulations around sharing this data, especially internationally. So we might not even be able to get the data if it is available, just over regulations. Um, you know, going back to those top five uh, and measurements to engage partner engagements, this is why I think we should be doing more. Right? Just because we have deal reg set up doesn't mean partners are registering deals. Just because they're tracking conversion in their CRM system doesn't mean we have visibility into their CRM system. Right? So I think the reality is there's no one silver bullet to measure engagement. 
So we need to be doing as many measurements as possible, knowing that we might have data challenges through any one measurement. And I'll tell you, having a number of partner marketers on my show on the road, the reality is a lot of it just comes down to relationships, right? Just good old school fashion, I'm gonna meet with this partner face-to-face -face or virtually, develop a relationship, and lean on that relationship to make sure that they're engaged, they're happy, and I'm gonna leverage that internally to showcase success and drive more investment. Our, our VP of, of, of the partner side of the house, is of the partner ecosystem, Erica Vellini, talks a lot about intimacy yeah. and creating intimacy with, with our partners. And I do think that those, those in-person opportunities are so critical, right? Because again, the trust and be trusted, yeah. um, that allows that opportunity to, to shine, right? It's, you share things that you normally wouldn't with people um, over Zoom or, or wherever. Yeah, I think that's huge on the partner yeah. side too, because you, know, you, you guys are in it to win it together, yeah. right? And yeah. If you don't have that trust, it's going to be really hard to work together. 100%. Yeah. No matter how advanced we get in technologies, a lot of it comes back to relationships. So next we ask, all right, how are you driving investment to help with partner engagement activities? Well, the number one thing people are investing in to drive engagement is working with third-party media agencies like a foundry, right? And they're often coming to us to help develop multi-partner programs, right? So how can we set up a program framework say packages that we could take to multiple partners and scale globally easily. And I think the easy, the easy thing is key there, right? I hear oftentimes we wouldn't hit the easy button for our partners. And that's what we've done at scale to help make things easier and drive partner engagement. The third thing that they're doing is they're investing in self portals, right? So portals that partners can come into, self-select packages, oftentimes a lot of the multi-partner packages we develop actually live in portals. People can activate them quickly and they can do it on a, on a regional, global basis. Fourth thing that they're doing is they're building multi-partner online experiences. So rather than developing these packages that have to be executed individually, what if we create just one digital program that partners can opt into and it's a little bit easier for us to control the, the messaging, the framework, and also have visibility into the reporting holistically. And also we can import five, 10 dozens of different partners into it. Stick around, I actually have an example of what this looks like because it's a little bit of a newer, innovative thing we're doing in market. And last but not least, they're investing in concierge programs. A little bit more of an overhead, uh, a little bit more costly, but we can have, say, virtual partner marketing managers reach out to partners on our behalf, try to drive engagement and get people on board and hold their hand in the process. Again, I told you we would come back to those with a formal strategy versus informal strategy. And it turns out those with a formal strategy are more likely to get investment to support these multi-partner activities, specifically multi-partner packages, multi-partner online experiences, and the self-service portals. Again, 69% of respondents had a formal documented strategy compared to 20% had an informal strategy. Those with an informal strategy are getting less investment to support these multi-partner activities. I think it's as simple as, hey, we're gonna document what it is we're gonna do, why we're doing it, how are we gonna measure success, and then how are we gonna optimize and report on that success? People that are doing that are getting the investment to try these multi-partner tactics. Um, it's just easier to communicate what it is you're gonna do and how you're gonna report back on it. Now we're gonna dive into program and success metrics, specifically what's working and not working in programs out there. Now we're gonna start with success metrics first because this is where we've seen a significant change over the last two years. Specifically, we've seen the number of qualified leads generated pop to the top as the number one success metric in programs compared to last place two years ago and in fourth place in 2019. Some of the other top success metrics this year, increased number of actual customers, growth rate of market share, total revenue generated from programs, and then partner engagement sat satisfaction of relationships, right? That's still in the top five. It's still important even though it's last. Now, two years ago, total revenue generated from programs was number one, and it was number one in 2019, right? I personally have seen this in the market where last couple of years, it's been, hey, let's just generate as many leads as possible scale at all costs, and we'll just fill the funnel. This year, marketers are taking a little bit of a step back, and demand is still incredibly important, but we're really focused on generating qualified leads. It's really a quality over quantity 
landscape out there right now. I think also marketers over the last couple of years have just gotten more sophisticated in that, you know, just because I run a lead gen program this quarter doesn't mean I'm going to expect revenue next quarter, right? It's going to take some time. Oftentimes we have lengthy sales cycles and we've also developed by large, really robust lead nurturing, um, BDR teams, you know, we're going to work these leads and, and let them generate pipeline and then revenue. So if we can really focus on lead conversions and we know what type of leads that need to go in the system, we can put all of our energy and focus on getting that right lead. We know if we get the right qualified lead, it's going to work its way through and we'll eventually get pipeline and revenue. And that's where we're going to focus our success metrics on. Now, when we look at the effectiveness on programs, again, we're going back to those with a formal versus informal strategy. Those with a formal strategy are seeing a lot more success in terms of the effectiveness of their programs, specifically around events, demand generation, social media presence, lead nurturing, and branding. Now, if I think about what all these programs have in common, it's that they're all data rich in terms of their reporting capabilities. Right? When I think about a formal documented strategy as a marketer, I can put a lot of time and energy into thinking and documenting what are our benchmarks? What are the success metrics that we want to reach in terms of specific data? Then what we can start to do is we can start to optimize based on underperforming programs and start leaning into performing programs. And when we start to do this on a quarterly basis, over time we're going to see our programs become a lot more effective. On an informal strategy, it might just be, hey, we want to focus on demand gen. We're looking for X ROI. We either get it or we don't, right? If we can start to optimize continually based on our benchmarks, we're going to see a lot more effectiveness. So it's no surprise then, those with a formal strategy, they see a lot more ROI from their programs. Now, what was surprising to me about this particular result is that we're actually seeing it around content development as well. Right? So again, an informal strategy might be, hey, we just need thought leadership content out there to go with our partner marketing activities. More formal strategy might actually dictate what are the ROI success metrics tied to content development? How are we going to measure success? If we can document that, we can start then gauging if our content development activities are successful or not. Where are we seeing ROI? How is it tied to thought leadership? How is it tied to lead conversions and lead engagement, content engagement? Right? When we can document these success metrics, we can start to optimize away from poor performing content into higher performing content. And that's going to become a feedback loop in terms of how we develop content that we take to market. When it comes to running programs, about three quarters of respondents are working with third party media companies like Foundry. Top three reasons that they're working with companies like Foundry are expertise and specialization, objectivity, and then just innovative tools and technology. So when I think about Foundry, you know, formerly IDG, you know, we've been helping educate tech buyers for 60 years. We have a pretty good understanding of good content that resonates with tech buyers that can drive results in marketing programs. We run thousands of programs every year, right? And we've developed and acquired really innovative tools and technologies to help us deliver results at scale. So that's something that marketers are leveraging to help drive results at scale for their organization. So it's no surprise that 80% of Respondents that are working with third-party agencies like Foundry are seeing better results compared to programs that they run in-house, right? I'll tell you what we're not doing, though. We're not necessarily replacing their activities, but we're supplementing their efforts to grow scale. Let's take events as an example. A lot of the partner marketers that we work with run events on their own, but they still come to us to buy events because they know they can supplement and elevate their own events activities. They can partner with a CIO editorially driven event, drive thought leadership, and get in front of a qualified audience to drive pipeline, right? So my main takeaway is figure out where you're strong, you know, where are you resource strained, and where do you need to elevate to drive more results at scale? And a third party agency can come in and help you drive those particular results. So this is an example of a multi-partner online experience. I told you I wanted to, to share an example with you. And we launched this to help drive a brand of demand storytelling experience for tech buyers because we've seen through our research that when content is presented in an organized way, tech buyers are more likely to engage and respond to it. Right? I think we have a tendency to develop content, spray it out there, and hope buyers figure it out along the way. Right? We wanted to do this in such a way that we could organize content almost like a Spotify playlist, playlist for tech buyers. You have an overarching theme 
And then within it, you can have content playlists, right, with sub-themes. And each sub-theme is storytelling content. It can be articles, uh, it can be podcasts, white papers, case studies. But we present it in a cons consecutive way that makes sense to the buyer. Now, this has been a really hot selling product for us in terms of driving thought leadership, brand of demand storytelling experience, but more importantly, pipeline results. Because what we can do is we can drive a high touch experience with the tech buyer. So when they become a lead, they've already done a lot of research and been highly engaged. What we started doing was we started working with partners, say, I'm going to use Intel as an example here. Intel has multiple partners, and each content collection can be an individual partner program. Right? So they can set up an overarching theme. And within it, partners can come in and tell their own unique story with their own unique content. And by the way, each content collection can have its own deliverables, such as leads, its own content, whether we need to develop content, utilize their content, their own impressions. And we can turn the dial, whether our partner wants to go heavier on brand, heavier on custom content, heavier on leads, you name it. And it allows a company like Intel to have a little bit more control over the experience, have control over the, the thematic messaging. More importantly, have a visibility into the robust reporting, right? as opposed to having to check, track down reporting with individual partners. So it's been our way to be able to sc scale multiple partners within a single program framework. So a couple main takeaways from this study is, you know, formal strategies are definitely driving better results. They're driving more effective programs and greater ROI, but I take it back to you know what I hear a lot of people on my show say is you got to constantly advocate for your partners. You got to constantly be selling the value of what you're doing, even within organizations that are invested heavily in partner marketing. When you have a documented strategy, it really backs your case, not only internally, but also with your partners. Some that might really believe in the partner marketing activities you're doing, some that might take a little bit more selling at the executive level. Documented strategy is going to help because the reality is. My second point here is the value perception differs, right? So not only is a document strategy going to help you do that, but also leaning into the programs that you think might be more valued by that organization. Whether it's a smaller company, which again, might be more heavily focused on developing content, their brand equity, um, or even maybe social, you got to tie that what's also important to your organization and find that intersection that's going to drive value for both organizations. Third, measuring partner engagement is tough. Right? So think about how you're doing it today. Maybe add a couple different measurement opportunities there. Um, but just know that the relationship trumps how you're measuring success. Right? The data definitely supports you, but that not at the sake of the partnership that you can form through your relationship. I think if you can do both successfully, you're going to be in a lot better position to drive success, both internally as well with your partners. Last but not least, media agencies out there are driving results for partner marketers. Take Foundry, for example. We run thousands of marketing programs every year, and we run hundreds of partner marketing programs. So we have a really net good knack for doing this at scale. We know what's working, what's not working out there. And we also understand the nuances of partner marketing, whether that's MDF, proof of execution, working across multiple partners to scale and, and drive kickoffs simultaneously. We get it, and we're happy to share specifically how we can help you specifically with your partner marketing activities. If you want to learn more about our solutions or services, please head on over to foundryco.com slash our solutions. Again, that's foundryco.com slash our solutions, and check out what we can do. And there's a place there to get more information, and someone from my team will be happy to get back to you. So I hope this was helpful. I hope you had some fun, and I hope to see you again on the road. Until then, cheers. <laughs>